Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. I think we both share a passion for education, which we'll talk about in a minute. I did bring my Kleenex because the videos get me every time. Uh, but I suppose one question that's probably on everyone's mind is, OK, it's great. You both share this passion. But this is a FinTech conversation. So what are you both doing up here other than interrupting what I'm sure was a very delightful lunch? Um, but I think you know, one of the things we were talking about ahead of time is that the kinds of things that spur us to be passionate about the next generation are, frankly, the same kinds of issues that you're all facing in your organization, which is the level of uncertainty and, as Tim Brown would say, dislocation is pretty unprecedented, at least in any of our lifetimes. And as we all think about leading organizations, I think there's a big question about what do we do? Right? Most of us have been born and raised and, frankly, advanced in a certain world, in a stable world, in a world where picking out the things that are incorrect actually gets you ahead. So how do you transition to picking out what's correct? And one of the things that I was curious about from Dean's background is what's the most unique, fascinating, sort of productive response to uncertainty that you've seen? I think uncertainty dealt with properly is the best stimulus for change, innovation, change for the good. Uh, in big institutions, and we've seen the yin and the yang of this even just here today, big institutions are stable, and the world needs stability. I, I know all of you are acting like those little guys and those entrepreneurs have the big advantage. Well, there's something nice about being big. Those little guys want to become that one day. And frankly, while we can always make it seem exciting that uncertainty and change and Frankly, small guys can fail all the time, pick themselves up, and try again, and nobody's hurt. If governments fail, that's a calamity. If big companies suddenly can't, you know, you heard what happens if cyber. Basically, I guess what I'd say is uncertainty, as long as you can get through the failures that inevitably come in an uncertain world when you try something, which most of the time new things don't work, as long as the failure can be the failure of a project, not of a person or a group. Or a, you learn to deal with it. And then as you become bigger and deliver solutions that the world counts on, the bad news is you can't fail anymore. But the good news is those stable systems become what the world depends on. And the next generation of disruptors come along. And every once in a while, one of them breaks through and hopefully slowly takes over raises the bar and gives the world a better solution that becomes a stable uh, piece. I think you said something that's really important and something that we're grappling with at City is how do you separate the failure of an idea from the failure of a person, right? I think a lot of institutions, those two, even though intellectually we all understand they're different, they kind of get bound up together. And you know, some guy comes and he gives the presentation and it doesn't work and everyone says, oh, that guy is not. But the Valley inventors have a really different view of failure. And to your point, not expensive, calamitous failure, but learning. How, how have you seen, and we can talk about what we do, but what, what have you seen that infuses the learning of uncertainty into bigger organizations, even where the organizations themselves need to remain relatively stable? In the big organizations that I've seen and worked with that actually do have a good balance, what they really do is they segregate a piece where they understand if I'm going to ask some small group of people to try to do something that they haven't done before, they have to understand that that small group of people will probably not have any better success rate than a bunch of entrepreneurs and startups, which we all know what is the number 95% fail in the first few years. The problem is it's part of the culture of most big organizations that they're weeding out failure. Now, an unintended consequence of getting consistency and stability and weeding out failure is it weeds out innovation. Big organizations are literally genetically created <clears throat> over time, evolved to places that like certainty. They're good at it. But a consequence is they don't change much for the better any more than they change for the worse. So, the little guys intrinsically try things and fail. They got nothing to lose. They start, they, they're just inherently, they'll try anything. 
big companies that have the resources that are willing to let some people go off, but let the rest of their organization know if that project fails, those people can be reintegrated. And, and that's a hard thing for most big organizations to do well. It's not part of their culture. Um, but in those, if you look around, the big companies that I've seen that actually do innovate, they have created a model that's sort of a parallel model and where the world depends on them to get everything right, they get it right, and then they have places where failure is tolerated. Yeah. It's something that we've experimented with a lot because to your point, you know, leaders of most of these organizations have been built on certainty and built in the fact that you, you know, we used to always talk about the, the parallel between big organizations like financial services and big hospitals, where in the old days, morbidity and mortality was a little bit more of a formality than it was a real learning experience. Whereas what that led to was no one was really figuring out what could they do differently so that the consequences were less dire. Obviously, those are different consequences than what we all deal with every day, but how do we create a culture within the leadership that embraces learning? I think failure is sometimes a scarier word, but embraces learning. And how do we not set innovation off to the side, but bring it into the core so that there's a place for senior leaders, management, junior people to say, I learned a lot this week about what's going to work for our clients or what's not, and integrate that into the system. So I think more and more at least in my travels, I'm sure in yours as well, and everyone in the audience here, what we're seeing is how do large companies take pieces of what's, what entrepreneurs do, pieces of what small companies do, and try and bring that in so that the pace of productive change can be a little bit faster. I, I, again, I think especially in a forum like this where more and more everybody talks about innovation as nothing but a positive thing and entrepreneurship as nothing but a positive thing, all of you big guys shouldn't be beating yourself up that much. What the public really depends on most of the time is certainty. How many people want to get back on that plane to fly home and hear that, yeah, most of the time the wings stay on this new airplane. Uh, or how many of you want to go to that doctor in that great hospital and he says, or she says, as they're rolling you in for that, you know, trivial surgery that they've done a thousand times. I got a great new idea. I mean, the fact is, most of the time for critical things, I mean, why is this country so nervous now? Because we have a president coming in that maybe he's great, maybe he's awful, but mostly what people are concerned about is certainty. And when you're playing as an entrepreneur, uncertainty and flexibility and the willingness and ability to fail and recover from it is your strongest asset against big structured organizations. But when you got a government and you got a country at stake, maybe not so much. I agree. I think one thing, though, that we've been thinking about a lot is that most of us were raised, to your point about politics and government, in an era where stability was more the norm. And we now all serve clients, whether they're institutional clients or consumer clients, who are living in a world that's much more uncertain. So. And to me, one big question for the financial services community is, how do we help our customers and our clients navigate that uncertainty? Which isn't necessarily an answer from within, but could demand a very different orientation towards our customers, because the world just isn't the same as it was 10, 15, 20, 50 years ago. And I think uncertainty, whether you like it or not, is spreading, again, as we've seen in the recent past, it's spreading well beyond those places where it used to be, I think, in an environment where we as a culture and as a country could tolerate it. Uh, as we start seeing, whether it's in you know, proteomics and genomics and nanotechnology and bioengineered food stuff, we're, we're seeing things happen at such a scale. Uh, and as you saw this morning with cyber, and you know, sooner or later, we we recognize that the effect of big technical advances that have an intended consequence, as all technical advances, will have big unintended consequences. But as the world gets more sophisticated and more dependent on technology, those unintended consequences are starting to reveal themselves as showing us how fragile it all is, which is why I want a generation of kids to deal with this. But, but we need to start 
dealing with uncertainty, not at the level of that crazy little venture that could fail and it's okay and they'll get themselves back together. We are now living in a world where we better start creating the ability to instantly respond to the oopses of uncertainty that gave us something we never expected to happen and we're gonna have a crisis that we're gonna have to resolve very quickly. I think, you know, I'd be curious in the audience, but my suspicion is that most people sitting here are probably focused on, okay, we, we know we've gotta grapple with uncertainty, we know we have to be agile, we know we have to sort of learn fast, he who learns fastest wins, right? All that's kind of known and one of the, one of the principles could be that you know, you could draw a picture of a bank um, like a first grader might as an institution, but the reality is that that's not what any of our institutions really are anymore, right? They're much more permeable. We've got all sorts of partnerships with large companies, small companies. You've been on a lot of sides of this. Um, I'm always curious what people think about, you know, we all know partnerships are important. My thesis is it's easy to start them. How do you make them stick and how do you cut them off when they're not working? The hardest question I'm ever asked, and it may, I think it's responsive to that. The last part of what you said, how do you know when to cut them off? It may not be as much partnerships. We start a lot of crazy projects, and most of them fail. I keep those private. I don't need to show the whole world how stupid we are. But every once in a while, one of our projects looks like it's gonna work, and then we're very proud to show it to the world. And you only have to be right once in a while with a big idea. The problem we have is you've been at this idea, one of your many that eventually might fail, and you're not sure, have I spent enough time? Have I spent enough money? Have I failed enough? Have I been enough pain that I should just shoot this one? And I roll around in bed at night saying, yeah, it's time. We've spent a year or two and we've spent millions. It's time to shoot this. If I don't shoot this, I'm just, I'm not learning from my mistakes. I'm stubborn, I'm belligerent, I'm in denial, I'm no, analytic. No, Stop. I'm sure that's not and then I sit there and say, if I stop now, I've lost my vision, I've lost my courage, i lost my confidence in my people. Technology's moving along. Tomorrow will be the day it all works. And every once in a while, a project that you think you should have shot early actually does work. Now, the good news is it worked. The bad news is it gives positive reinforcement of never giving up on those losers. And as they say, <laughs> the cat won't jump on a hot stove again. The trouble is he won't jump on a cold one either. And so I now have, 500 engineers working on a lot of projects, some of which I know are gonna fail. I just don't know which ones. And when to cut it off, when to say, the technology's just not there yet. When, have you learned enough to at least put it away for now is a very, I, I'm not so greedy. If there was some omnipotent being that could whisper in my ear the answer, I wouldn't say, how do you do it? Because if there was some omnipotent being that knows how to do it, we're all wasting our time. I'd like to work on it, with the surprise of, I don't, don't, don't give me the answer. But if that omnipotent being could at least just say to me, stop on this one, or keep going. I, that to me would end a lot of my sleepless nights. The answer is I don't know how to answer the question of when do you stop. Yeah. I think it's one of the most curious things. There's both when do you stop and how do you make sure that the ideas that are being brought forth, we talk about sort of what does leadership mean in this kind of environment? How do you make sure that the ideas being brought forth aren't judged by the person who's bringing them forth. And I think a lot of people think about that in terms of hierarchy in our organizations. You know, you gotta be senior enough or you've gotta have a PowerPoint presentation that's thick enough um, in order to get through the door and make that presentation. But I also think it, has to co it comes back to what you said earlier around failure, right? How do you make sure that the guy who's failed or the gal who's had a couple of projects that just went nowhere that next idea might be a good one. So there's both, what do you do with the existing ones and how do you make sure as a leader that you are open to the fact that someone who has failed multiple times over may have learned an awful lot from that and may be bringing you something now that's actually going to be that much more important to what you're trying to accomplish. So back to your question, how do you decide? I think the one consistency thing I've seen in big organizations, which makes it harder for them to innovate versus the little guy. Even though they have more experience, more knowledge, more people, more money, they have more everything. Why is it that they get every once in a while toppled? Is because big organizations, after a person has failed a few times, maybe because they took on the most difficult issues, they're gone. 
Whereas if somebody does a pretty good job and meets their expectation, they keep moving up. And in big organizations, and you probably don't want to hear this because you, but in big organizations, there is such a disproportionate, you know, they reward success a little bit appropriately. They can't reward it as much as that entrepreneur who sells out for $100 million. But generally, in a big organization, if you do pretty well, you'll get rewarded and you'll keep moving up. If you make a pretty big mistake once or twice, you're toast. That is a very good filter that says over time, a big organization is going to have people that are pretty good at making incremental decisions to keep their big, stable organization going, which is a good thing for a big organization. I'm not knocking it. But it also explains why big organizations are unlikely to fundamentally have a culture that not only tolerates, but kind of celebrates those big ideas. I've come to believe that that's probably fine. That's why in the ecosystem of the world, the big guys ought to go out and every once in a while severely overpay to buy that little company because they really didn't overpay because they bought the one out of 10 that actually survived. So they paid a premium for it, but they weren't distracted by the nine losers. I don't know. I, I disagree with that a little bit in that I think there are lots and lots of people who are in big organizations who like people who are entrepreneurial or ingenious outside of big organizations have not only good ideas about what to do, but have fairly deep understanding of the intricacies of what's wrong. And there's a lot to be said for understanding deeply what's wrong in a system if someone can help you create the conditions to be a little bit open-minded about how you might fix and make it right. I think what big organizations tend to do is struggle with creating the conditions to take a group of people who are deeply studied and understand the challenges, uh, being able to create those conditions so that they can actually say, let's come at this a different way. And those conditions exist so freely outside of those organizations. As I said, inside any organization, all people are, the, you know, you're an individual, I'm an individual. And we as individuals typically tolerate mistakes. We as a culture root for the underdog. I think one of the reasons there's so many entrepreneurs in America is not our education system, it's our culture. In all of our movies, the good guy is some kind of vigilante that's trying to take on Herculean stuff and fails always till the last two minutes of the 90 minute thing and then he wins and everybody applauds. And, and we as a culture, I think, it's biblical, you know, forgive. The trouble is in big companies, when you finally read through their whole HR manual, it pretty much boils down to, yeah, forgiveness is biblical. It's just not corporate policy. And the fact is, in most big companies, the management is there to prevent failure from happening. You can say it any way you want, and it's a good thing that they do it, but I'll still tell you, as an unintended consequence of that, most multi-billion dollar giant companies do not spend most of their assets, they do not take most of their best people and apply them to some new thing that's not even a product or service yet. It would be irresponsible. They got a bigger set of things to worry about. Whereas in that little organization, that's the only thing they got to worry about. So, I'll, but I'll still say, in some big organizations, I have seen them actually say, for all the reasons you said, they know the big problem. They, they have access in a way better way than the little guys to resources and information that if they chose to, they could disrupt their own industry. And some of them do that, and some of them do it pretty well, but they don't do it with the same people that have the job of keeping the world moving, keeping the lights on, keeping the water working. They have different people with different mindset, uh, with a different objective, and a different tolerance for failure. So I want to take just a couple of minutes at the end because we led into this with a few videos of what FIRST has done, which I think is critically important. And I think much of what we're passionate about is how do you bring a group of people into, whether it's technology or financial services or any other career who might not have expected that that's what they were going to do, right? How do you transform technology from a separate thing that one studies to something that everyone needs to know something about to go apply themselves to some of these problems. So, uh, yeah, I, I started out my career in Teach for America trying to figure out how do we bring math and science to a community that unfortunately just wasn't getting a lot of that in our country. Um, with FIRST, you've reached millions of kids who probably never thought about computer science and may not end up being computer scientists. So if there was something that you'd want to share with the financial services community about the experience that you've had with FIRST, how you think about untapped potential 
in, in the country and around the world? What, what would you want everyone here to know? I guess the reason I came is I thought there'd be a room full of geeks and nerds and business leaders that realize more than the average person how critical it is for your own future, for your workforce, in our collective self-interest, that we have more technically capable people. But the answer to how do we do it, school makes math a subject, engineering a subject. I think of science and tech and why it fits here. They, they are not careers, they're tools. If you took kids to school and they spent 10 years starting in kindergarten learning to bounce a ball but never heard of basketball, and then they got quizzes on the size of the field, and then in third grade they got quizzes and tests on the history of it. If they did all sorts of things for 10 or 12 years before they ever played the game, there'd be nobody playing the game. They need to understand that math is a powerful tool and science is a set of rules that give you incredible capabilities to understand the world around you and to do things that turn your imagination into reality. And we use the format of sports and entertainment, which are big in our culture. Everybody last night was here watching a football game. The fact is, that's okay, but recognize if what drives people, what drives their passion is things that you know, they aspire to do. We, we have so effectively killed the idea, particularly among girls and minorities, in this country that engineering is cool and fun and accessible and exciting. I just said 25 years ago, let's make a sport that has all the same trappings. They don't get quizzes and tests. They get trophies and awards and they bring the mascot and the cheerleaders and the band and they celebrate when they win and they celebrate when they lose like sport. It's not surprising why people love sports. It's not surprising why they're intimidated by math and science, but the world the future of this country is not going to depend on our ball bouncers. If we don't lead the world in competence, in technology, we will become a third world and all the consequences of what a third world country has in terms of healthcare, security, you name it. So in a free culture where you get what you celebrate, my position was get to kids early and convince them that science and engineering, it's not a thing. It's a tool, it's a fun tool. Learn to use it, develop the muscle upstairs, we'll put it in a fun play environment where you don't get quizzes and tests, and you could end up taking a whole generation of Americans, the first generation, of that, that across the board embrace this. Then they show up for school as excited to find the first coach as the football coach, except as we said, it's the only sport where every kid can turn pro. I, I love that, and I think it's amazing what Dean has done. I guess I would leave this audience with, with one thought about that, which is I actually believe that a lot of the principles of entrepreneurship, the idea of design, of prototyping, of figuring out what technologists do you need to test out the, the idea that you have, that those are as fascinating, as compelling to adults as they are to kids. Uh, we see this throughout our organization that if you put the same kind of principles in place where you give people the tools to play the game, e.g. build the MVP for a client product that you think is going to solve someone's problem, get out there and change something about the way that we deliver financial services to customers today, that that can be as compelling and as, as much of a game changer as it is when you're young to say, I don't want to just study the parabola, I actually want to get in and, and play the game. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully this has been useful, interesting. I know you've got an amazing post-lunch lineup, so I'm anxious to talk to you, some of you afterwards, but thank you very much for your time. And one quick statement. Uh, Scott McKay, who's on the board, is here and is part of your organization, is on the board of FIRST for many years. Um, he has a bunch of these things, but we had our 2017 kickoff this weekend to start our season. 52,000 teams from 86 countries. And starting in March, they will have the next month and they have to build their robots. But every weekend in March, we start having regional events in pretty big university field houses. And our season this year for 140 events throughout March, 20 or 30 per weekend, ending it's with- March Madness. March Madness. Ends with uh, everybody showing up at the same arena where they do the Super Bowl down in, in Houston. 
but I'm hoping you'll all look at this thing, and whether it's your kids, your grandkids, yourself, you will go to what I think you'll see is about the most fun sporting event you'll ever go to, except the content, what these kids are learning. And by the way, you need them more than they need you. Uh, what these kids are learning, you should, it should invigorate you and excite you about the future. And I hope you'll be there and I hope you'll support them. If you're not willing to be role models in this world for these kids, we'll all get what we deserve. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.